Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Very, very glad to uh, see you all here. Um, as you know, we have a regular seminar series now at the Center for Policy Research, uh, which is called Clearing the Air? Question mark. Um, and today we are very, very pleased to have with us uh, Professor Kalpana Balakrishnan, uh, who is uh, in town to release, um, I think it's the, the Global Burden of Disease uh, study, which will be released uh, tomorrow. Uh, Professor Balakrishnan is, uh, is very, very accomplished in this area. She's the director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. Uh, she's also uh, part of the SRU ICMR Center for Advanced Research on Air Quality, Climate and Health uh, at the Department of Environmental Health Engineering at Sri Ramachandra uh, University at Chennai. Um, and uh, Dr. Balakrishnan has been involved in the area of exposure assessment and environmental epidemiology uh, with a focus on air pollution uh, for many, many years. She's contributed to several national and international studies, including, including the Global Burden of Disease Study, uh, WHO Air Quality Guidelines, uh, and so on and so forth. Very, very involved also in the national uh, policy uh, space on this. She's a member of the National Steering Committee on Air Pollution uh, Related Issues for Health Effects, uh, and uh, also chairs the Environmental Risk Factors Expert Group uh, for the India State Level Burden of Disease uh, Initiative. So uh, we're really, really very grateful that she's taken the time to, um, to be here with us. And Dr. Balakrishnan is going to uh, talk to us today uh, about air pollution as a preventable cause of adverse birth outcomes in India, uh, pre presenting new evidence from cohort studies in Tamil Nadu. So welcome, Dr. Balakrishnan. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a little close, yeah. Um, it's a great pr uh, pleasure and privilege to be here, um, and uh, not sure if I can. Am I audible? Yeah. 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 I, I never take a risk sitting down at four. You know, I'm a college professor, so I always like to stand up and shout really loud on. Uh, whatever I have to say, otherwise I can't hold anybody's attention at four, but it's a great pleasure and privilege, uh, Dr. Navroj, to be here at CPR, um, and, um, and when Shibani contacted me uh, a month or two ago um, uh, regarding this, um, uh, we were thinking of, you know, what might be uh, special about um, this narrative uh, that many of you here in Delhi, I think, must be hearing again and again and again. Um, so if it was a narrative that is centered around the GBD in terms of the uh, mortality and the morbidity estimates, then the questions of uncertainty, the questions of uh, the models, the questions of where these studies are coming from, the questions on uh, why are there no India cohort studies, you know, uh, is, this really, is this evidence really transferable, can we move to action? Uh, you know, sometimes you are so much on the defensive um, um, these are all good points to debate on, but we thought that, you know, uh, it might be useful to have a fresh um, take on this subject by presenting some of the um, really recent results from the cohort studies uh, that uh, were launched about five years ago uh, with technical support from the Indian Council of Medical Research. And because cohort studies end up uh, being very time consuming, the kinds of health outcomes that are amenable for examination within cohort studies, um, you know, have to be strategically picked because otherwise you end up waiting, uh, uh, you know, a very long time before the first pieces of evidence start pulling, uh, start pouring in. So we thought, you know, um, uh, if we can sort of really pick on a particular uh, health outcome that can have a large implication for public health. Uh, is very amenable to policy, can be accomplished over relatively short terms of follow-up, uh, including addressing the challenges of sort of really um, uh, reconstructing exposures and following the outcomes periodically, it would really be adverse birth outcomes for India. Uh, this, why, if, if, if um, you know, maternal mortality and child mortality indicators, um, you know, have, um, shown uh, a major improvement over the last two decades. Uh, much of the improvements have been made in terms of child mortality. Uh, 
um, you know, uh, the neonatal mortality is getting better to be a picture, but really the um, the uh, the maternal um, you know um, uh, um, health has really not been studied very um, very well. And in particular, low birth weight or birth weight as an indicator of life course um, uh, implications for health have not been uh, examined. So um, I thought that it will be um, quite useful um, today to um, um, to sort of really uh, look at um, how we approach the cohort um, with some backgrounds on why uh, such a cohort was useful and then share results um, uh, from the cohort uh, itself as well as the implications for policy. Um, any one of you uh, who's either um, um, from India or living in India, you know, doesn't need any explanation. Any kind of air pollution and health effects examination is not helped by a compartmentalized view on exposures. Um, rural versus urban, indoor versus outdoor, uh, you know, um, morning versus evening, uh, you know, winter versus summer, because the spatio-temporal gradients in exposure, the, uh, the rural-urban, uh, you know, continuums are so poorly uh, understood that uh, we would end up severely uh, misclassifying exposure and uh, sort of a death knell for uh, epidemiological studies. So any kind of exposure misclassification is only as worse, if not worse, than confounding when we come to epidemiological uh, examinations. So, um, um, you know, as much as um, we recognize that uh, there are so many different uh, exposure environments and sources, uh, we also recognize that when we look at the two large pockets in which all these sources have been clubbed, uh, the ambient air pollution, uh, you know, commonly referred to as outdoor air pollution, and household air pollution, uh, commonly referred uh, to as indoor air pollution, although it's not quite indoor air pollution, it's really household sources that contribute to both indoor and outdoor air pollution, are bunched um, together um, in this, um, uh, in this um, risk factor called air pollution. And uh, the, um, this you may have seen from the last November release of the India State Level Burden of Disease exercise, that air pollution, uh, ambient air pollution and household air pollution together uh, rank amongst uh, the highest risk factors contributing to the burden of disease in India, uh, uh, only exceeded by uh, child and maternal malnutrition-related risk factors. Um, and, um, you know, exceed uh, the risks uh, posed by, um, you know, diet, uh, by blood pressure, and several, several other risk factors that we have um, a lot of familiarity with. Um, and uh, if you can also look at the relative contributions from the disease conditions contributing to this overall burden, uh, if you look at the, uh, the bars um, uh, and its color code, if some, for those of you who cannot read the legend, the blue bar is primarily from non-communicable diseases. Uh, so you can recognize that air pollution, not only is air pollution burden high, amongst the highest, but the burden from non-communicable diseases that are attributable to air pollution is also amongst the highest. A picture that is dramatically changing uh, from many years ago when bulk of the burdens from air pollution was from childhood pneumonia, essentially childhood respiratory infectious diseases, which is really the red bar up there. Um, and you can recognize uh, the topmost risk factor, child and maternal malnutrition, is almost all red because anytime you have a child who is undernourished and who has, um, you know, doesn't have the right kind of maternal or child indicators, ends up suffering from a whole range of childhood battery of infectious diseases. Uh, so clearly, um, air pollution is making less of an impact in uh, childhood respiratory infections, mostly because our, you know, respiratory, childhood respiratory infection rates are going down and they are not, you know, any burden that is attributable to a risk factor plays on the underlying rates of that particular disease. So if your non-communicable disease burden in India is increasing, the percent attributable to air pollution is also uh, likely to be uh, enlarged. This is what is um, reflected here. And given this burden and also uh, the differentials across the, um, uh, the states, this is really, you know, you can clearly expect the burden to be uh, 
high in the you know the most populous states but if you look at the burden rates essentially disability adjusted life year rate across states in india again from the state level burden of disease um, uh, report that we um, uh, released uh, last year in 2017 uh, you can clearly see uh, you know uh, the trends um, uh, in the daily rates um, um, attributable to both ambient and household uh, air pollution with uh, with the northern states and the central states um, being you know far in excess of the southern states um, and um, and um, the trends in attributable uh, burdens for the various risk factors uh, you know while for the most part um, have remained um, constant um, air pollution certainly has moved up uh, in terms of its um, uh, total um, you know burden uh, contributions um, so just a, you know a background um, to why uh, we are having to deal uh, with, uh, you know, um, augmenting the evidence for policy on air pollution. The burden is large, the burden is growing, and the burden, uh, you know, poses some of the most severe constraints on the states already struggling with a whole lot of other development issues, including the northeastern states and the other, uh, you know, uh, most populous states of, uh, of the country. And uh, this is not that, you know, Sharad was here, I believe, a couple of months ago. This is from Sharad's, um, uh, you know, um, uh, publication, but essentially from the global uh, WHO um, Global Observatory uh, that sort of is keeping tabs on cities with um, um, and, and air quality. And unfortunately, India has a dubious distinction of, uh, you know, uh, increasing the number of cities that are occupying the 100 worst cities um, uh, in terms of air pollution. This is as far as ambient air pollution is um, uh, concerned, and uh, the um, the ambient air pollution exposures um, uh, that were used uh, for uh, the GPD um, exercises, um, uh, you know, from India are displayed here. Uh, again, clearly not a pretty picture. Uh, the uh, the national uh, average population weighted exposure for ambient air pollution is estimated to be about. 74 micrograms per meter cube of PM 2.5 annual average, and the um, uh, um, um, and uh, the PM 10 exposures are um, are even higher. And those of you who are familiar with WHO air quality guidelines um, um, may may recognize that this is more than seven times greater than the value of 10 micrograms per meter cube of PM 2.5. And this is the national average. Clearly, uh, you know, a lot of polarization in terms of um, the hot spots um, that are across the country. Um, and if you're looking, um, if that's not enough, uh, household air pollution exposures, um, you know, in terms of air pollution exposures associated with the use of solid cook fuels, uh, primarily by rural populations, um, you know, this was our model that we developed for the Global Burden of Disease 2010 estimate. So you can recognize if you are talking about indoor versus outdoor, rural versus urban, you know, you can see where this is completely falling apart. Rural is not clean. Indoor is not clean. This is all counterintuitive uh, from the general uh, air pollution epidemiological literature because most people... Where, um, where this epidemiology has been generated, rural is clean. Indoor is far cleaner than the outdoors, uh, you know, unless you have, of course, a smoker in the house or something like that. But all the, you know, so-called paradigms that we um, end up um, adopting in epidemiology start to break down if you don't have reliable ways of actually measuring and reliable ways of quantifying, not just saying, you know, commercial versus residential, rural versus urban, sort of, you know, surrogate indicators of potential exposures. But when you actually start measuring out the exposures uh, and our estimate of rural exposures for women, um, you know, is about 337 micrograms per meter cube of PM 2.5 for women using biomass fuels. Clearly, you know, um, uh, you know, it's not something to argue about in terms of is it going to affect health is not something that we need to be arguing about. Is it, you know, what can you do about it and what, what, what you know, um, what, what do we know about it in terms of being able to inform the, the policy discourse on it?
So uh, when the GBD assessments uh, came um, uh, came about, uh, you know they uh, they were looking at you know primarily ambient air pollution data in the initial cycles of it. The World Bank has the distinction of actually uh, leading uh, the first ever uh, burden of disease assessment way back in the 1990s. Um, and at that time, there wasn't even household air pollution data available. We had some data on, you know, percent population using solid fuels. And that was mostly at the aggregate level. Uh, you know, census, of course, has been collecting this information from from the last two or three cycles. Um, so essentially, it ended up being very ambient air pollution focused. And it wasn't until 2000 uh, the WHO and the World Bank was, um, they were able to sort of talk about household air pollution based on evidence um, available from developing countries in the same breath. Uh, so currently, the global burden of disease assessments is based on this battery of diseases. Uh, for which we have evidence mostly from developed country ambient air pollution studies, but some from the household air pollution developing country studies, but very little in terms of evidence from long-term cohort studies. And this I have um, uh, tried to um, uh, illustrate um, here. Uh, you know, essentially, um, uh, there is something that is very similar about health effects that are observed in relation to ambient air pollution, essentially associated with fossil fuel sources and um, uh, you know um, urban outdoor sources, household air pollution associated with solid fuel combustion, and active tobacco smoke. And this is because uh, you know what we have in all these four categories are products of incomplete combustion. So what we call as PICs. The PICS is the common enemy in all these sources of air pollution. Some indoor, some outdoor, some urban, and some rural. So way back in 2010, for the first time, uh, there was a radical uh, you know, uh, transformation in the way we came about doing the burden calculations. We don't have the long-term evidence from cohort studies in developing country ambient air pollution. We don't have the evidence from the household air pollution settings from the rural areas. But if there is evidence for commonality of toxicity from what these sources are emitting in terms of pollution, if they are small particles, carbon monoxide, volatile hydrocarbons, and so forth, uh, and if you assume that, um, and there is some evidence to support that the toxicology is not very different across these various categories of particles, um, you know, could we try integrating the epidemiological evidence globally from all the pieces of literature that support an association between, um, you know, pollutants that are emitted from these sources and specific health impacts? Let me illustrate this, uh, you know, um, for all epidemiology and for all policy, um, the golden, um, you know, um, framing is one of exposure response. You need to know what the response is at a particular level of exposure because you want to get down to a lower level of exposure, hopefully for a lower, lower level of adverse response from a policy perspective, right? So you need to know what the relationship between a certain level of exposure and a certain level of response is if you want to recommend any kinds of actions. So if you had a hypothetical uh, you know, curve that illustrates the relative risk, in this particular I have illustrated, chosen the case of heart disease, and uh, you know, some metric of PM2.5 um, you know, uh, across these sources. Say, for example, if you had um, um, developed country ambient air pollution settings, your range of PM2.5 metric or exposures would be somewhere between 0 to 30 micrograms of uh, PM2.5 annual averages. Even that's high uh, for many developed countries. If you were looking at secondhand sm tobacco smoke literature, your PM2.5 would be slightly higher, uh, you know, somewhere in the range of 40 to 60 or 70 micrograms per meter cube of PM2.5. But if you were to look at um, you know, smokers, they would be off the charts. Uh, 
because their dose of PM2.5, you know, based on how much deposition happens per puff of cigarette is off the charts, you know. But we have a lot of literature supporting heart disease, stroke, you know, chronic obstructive lung disease, lung cancer, a whole range of uh, impacts, all of which have been observed in relation to ambient air pollution, uh, you know, uh, studies of developed countries. So if you have the lower bound of exposures as developed country ambient air pollution studies and the upper bound exposures as smoking, and you see exactly the same kinds of diseases, which is the battery that I showed you um, uh, with the woman's picture in it, suddenly, you know, you have what is called as an integrated exposure response function. And if you can think of mathematically, you know, developing a function that would fit the observed relative risks for these particular health outpoints across all these different types of sources, what happens is, you know, what we have is the household air pollution zone, which I mentioned to you, you know, somewhere between 240 to 300. This is a black box. We don't have the epidemiology for heart disease from rural poor countries. But if you had an integrated exposure response function that is inclusive of the HAP zone and inclusive of the India AAP zone, the ambient air pollution zone, magically you have the abilities, you know, now to at least estimate what might be the burden attributable to PM2.5 at that particular dose. And that's really the transformation that GPD made it possible. Um, and um, and uh, what is critically needed is an exposure estimate for the India AAP. You know, what is our best estimate for the India AAP? And what is our best estimate for, um, you know, um, um, uh, household air pollution? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and now, therefore, we are able to estimate the burden attributable to acute lower respiratory infections in children, stroke, lung cancer, ischemic heart disease, all using chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, all using the integrated exposure response functions. Um, and the numbers of 1.6 million deaths, uh, 45 million dallies attributable to air pollution are all based on this estimation of exposure that is informed by quite a bit by the India study, but we don't have the long-term cohort studies, but the burden is calculated. But when you when it comes to moving policy using this evidence, you run into a, uh, into a literally a stone wall because long-term cohort study evidence is not available from India. Uh, you know, impacts on heart disease would take a long time to study. Uh, so policymakers often raise this issue of, you know, what can you tell us about, you know, abhi badlenge to kitne saal lagenge, you know, so you, are, so you can't really answer the uh, question very easily with, you know, really chronic um, uh, impacts. Acute lower respiratory infections are, um, are uh, amongst children under two are a, major, uh, uh, you know, health endpoint to focus on for policy. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, we decided that, um, you know, so these are, sorry, the actual PM uh, integrated exposure response functions that the, the GBD uh, process used. Yeah. Question, back to sure. Uh, the fact that this is annual means, uh, 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 implies that that's what matters, so if you have sort of high variation across the year, you have much higher dosages for three months. Is that really yeah. substantially chip difference? Or yeah, it's an excellent question. We don't know the answer to the question. The reason it is um, it is averaged uh, annually is because we know that it's um, a long-term health endpoint, um, and we have the ability um, uh, from uh, models that rely on satellite uh, base estimates together with chemical transport models, the annual averages end up being far more stable than uh, the shorter term resolution predictions. Um, and therefore, since we are relying on modeled estimates, uh, we don't have long term measured averages for PM2.5 going over 20, 30, 40 years, uh, which was the case in the developed country um, uh, studies. Um, but nevertheless, if you're looking at long-term averages, you know, uh, for developing countries, for example, 
we only have the ability to construct annual averages. And that's, um, and in, in indeed, uh, the primary epidemiological studies, it has been shown that the long-term averages is a much better marker of um, exposure as opposed to the short-term uh, you know, uh, variations. Um, um, but of course, we quite don't know, uh, you know, um, the age uh, uh, specific, um, uh, you know, um, vulnerabilities in terms of, you know, um, is exposure between 20 to 30 years more important, they say, between 40 to 50 years. You know, we do know a 10-year cumulative exposure and you know, ends up uh, increasing your risk. But this is all... Uh, uh, you know, uh, calculated on the basis of per microgram change in annual average PM 2.5 concentrations. Um, so, um, um, so um, essentially, you know, while we are able to sort of really uh, parse out um, the uh, the burden uh, for uh, you know household air pollution, ambient air pollution, and tobacco smoking and uh, secondhand smoke for ischemic heart disease and child ALRI, uh, you know. Um, all of this, as I mentioned, uh, you know, left out, um, uh, you know, uh, my own group has been involved in the GBD exercises for nearly two decades now, uh, pretty much from uh, the mid-1990s. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we ended up asking ourselves the question, you know, if, we can, if you want to really inform India's policy level efforts, what might be um, a set of outcomes that we might want to pick on in terms of sort of really developing uh, exposure response primarily based on actual prospective data collection, choosing a health endpoint. And uh, it seems um, uh, that, you know, air pollution and pregnancy and air pollution and adverse pregnancy outcomes <coughs> seemed like a very good um, candidate. Um, uh, you know, uh, A, because um, we all recognize from a biology point of view uh, that a developing organism, in particular the fetus, is uniquely sensitive to environmental toxins. Uh, and uh, India, um, uh, you know, unfortunately continues to have some of the highest rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes, uh, nearly 10% are preterm, 27% uh, are low birth weight amongst the highest in the world. Uh, and uh, there are uh, immediate consequences of low birth weight in terms of infant morbidity and mortality, um, but there is an increasing base of evidence that low birth weight per se predisposes the child to decrements in cognitive function, developmental, um, you know, uh, impacts. But uh, what is really a game changer is um, is now the increasing recognition that. A low birth weight, uh, you know, uh, baby may be predisposed to a whole range of non-communicable diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, obesity, uh, and a whole range of things associated with uh, what is called as the metabolic syndrome battery. Um, so, uh, you know, any impacts on birth weight uh, associated with a ubiquitous risk factor such as air pollution. Everyone is exposed to air pollution in India in some form or the other. And should we find an association between air pollution and birth weight? Uh, and if birth weight is independently associated with this equally of health effects, including uh, infant you know, health outcomes, child health outcomes, and adult health outcomes, it would have a tremendous um, you know, uh, implication uh, in terms of um, uh, what we want to look at um, as a burden. And, um, and uh, existing epidemiological studies, most of whom have been only completed in the last 10 years and less than uh, you know, 50 uh, published studies, include a few countries in Asia, but primarily uh, focus on um, um, on a few um, uh, rather limited uh, battery of uh, studies. So anywhere in the world, not just in India, evidence between air pollution and birth weight is not as rich as the literature on the other, you know, battery of cardiorespiratory mortality and morbidity. Uh, in Asia and developing countries, we don't have the long-term cohort studies on cardiorespiratory mortality and morbidity, uh, but you know, even in uh, the developed countries, exposure response information on air pollution and birth weight is fairly limited. So that seemed like another rationale to study it primarily in India, and 
um, and looking at uh, you know what kind of you know outcome events could be potentially studied or have been studied you know of course is a whole battery of um, uh, you know um, morbidity and mortality outcomes you know primarily in trade sign deaths infant deaths or neonatal deaths um, and uh, you know low birth weight and a whole range of classifications um, uh, for preterm births as well as congenital abnormalities. So these are the outcome events that have been studied, and there is a whole lot of mechanistic uh, basis, uh, you know, mechanistic evidence on, uh, you know, why such a relationship is even possible. Uh, a lot of times, you know, people uh, might want to raise, you know, air pollution and respiratory symptoms, I can believe, yeah, maybe a stretch, air pollution and cardiovascular disease, long-term cumulative exposures, but really air pollution and birth weight, wouldn't it be so influenced by nutrition that we might not be picking up any kind of a, a relationship? But to, continue, uh, to, uh, to, to sort of um, cut a long story um, short, uh, there was you know, a fair amount of evidence from the mechanistic literature looking at biological plausibility for linking birth weight um, um, uh, and air pollution. So that brought us to uh, the particular study that um, I'm going to share the results from. Uh, you know, uh, we wanted to sort of really look at a rural urban cohort. I know I'm going to be presenting the results from birth weight, but the rural urban cohort actually examined a whole range of outcomes that, uh, that will be the subject of future uh, papers. Uh, you know, mainly because exposures are seamless across rural urban boundaries, um, and there are no, um, you know, environmental health cohorts uh, in India that we could actually, uh, you know, um, track um, in terms of uh, prospective cohorts. Uh, air pollution and birth weight have been the least well explored in terms of um, uh, exposure response relationships, and impacts on birth outcomes would have tremendous implications for policy. Um, and uh, there were, and there's a, a great opportunity to link with secondary data sets uh, for birth weight because um, uh, India, especially states like Tamil Nadu, now boast of greater than 99% institutional births, um, and birth weight is actually recorded. Uh, you know, with varying levels of accuracy, of course, uh, in the birth records um, across most states. So when you have a secondary data set that is amenable together with exposure information, now we have a large um, uh, expanding base of exposure information, and if you could actually, you know, demonstrate this linkage uh, between an outcome that is recorded routinely, uh, it allows you to piggyback on a large volume of secondary data sets to expand this across states, across you know uh, much larger uh, populations. Uh, so the uh, the Tamil Nadu air pollution and health effect cohort study that was completed between 2010 and 2015 uh, essentially was um, um, uh, examining air pollution in relation to uh, household fuel use that was primarily rural and indoor in terms of exposures. Uh, outdoor, um, uh, you know, um, uh, exposures that was primarily urban and fossil fuel uh, use related, and followed, um, you know, two cohorts, a mother-child cohort uh, and an adult cohort. I will be describing the results from the mother-child cohort today, uh, looking at birth weight and acute respiratory infections in children as the primary uh, outcome. Uh, in the mother-child cohort, uh, performing exposure assessment that integrates across indoor and outdoor uh, microenvironments. And in the adult cohort, we ended up uh, examining respiratory symptoms and lung function um, and ended up, uh, you know, conducting exposure modeling as well as, uh, you know, creating a biorepository. Uh, I will not have time to cover all the results from the TAFE cohort, but I have shared publications that describe the entire, co entire cohort methodology. Um, the uh, the uh, mother-child cohort ended up recruiting uh, participants from uh, rural um, primary health care centers and urban health posts uh, from all 10 metropolitan zones uh, of Chennai, uh, um, the boundary of which is illustrated there, um, as well as 110 villages in uh, Tiruvallur district adjoining uh, um, you know, uh, the Chennai metropolitan area. And the reason why we uh, decided to target uh, primary health care centers and urban health posts as a site of recruitment is because of the health-seeking behavior of uh, the participants who seek these healthcare facilities, uh, they would uh, could be expected 
to be belonging to more or less the same socioeconomic classes across rural urban boundaries. So we didn't want to have too much of a differential between the rural and urban and unexplained confounding uh, if we were to recruit uh, urban. So this is not uh, representative of the entire urban population, perhaps, but of the population that is of similar socioeconomic status as uh, those accessing the primary health care centers in the rural areas. Uh, so 1,285 uh, women were actually uh, uh, recruited. And uh, the first question that immediately comes to mind is, when you're looking at pregnant women and uh, li trying to link air pollution exposures to birth weight, what other you know, variables that uh, would you need uh, in order to sort of really adjust uh, for confounding that can potentially uh, you know, explain this association. So maternal age, birth order, maternal anemia, previous history of a low birth weight child, infant sex, maternal uh, body mass index, uh, you know, gestational age. So all the ones that um, you know, are in, uh, in, in purple could potentially impact birth weight independently. So essentially, we needed a prospective cohort. If you relied on facility provided uh, birth records, a lot of times this information is not captured. You might get birth weight, but you might not get parity. You might not get maternal weight gain information. You might not get maternal uh, you know, uh, age information even in some cases, or at least not an accurate one. Uh, you might not get, uh, in, you know, of course, you would get information on infant sex, but then you might not get information on socioeconomic status that could potentially impact exposures as well as the income, uh, as well as the outcome. And then there might be, uh, you know, so many other variables that, of course, we measured PM 2.5 exposures, uh, but, uh, you know, as a continuous metric, but nevertheless, that you can think of many, many variables that are sort of really influencing PM 2.5 exposures, including the type of house construction, the type of cook fuel, and, and so forth. Uh, most importantly, we wanted to sort of really make a distinction between term births and preterm births because we recognize that air pollution might be impacting these two categories of outcomes differently. So essentially, the 1285 women who were uh, recruited out of the primary health care centers and the urban health posts uh, were followed um, to, um, to collect data on health, which included you know, collecting their antenatal uh, records, uh, both from facility provided uh, information. So uh, Tamil Nadu has a, a you know a fairly uh, good um, you know antenatal record uh, collection system in place. If you were to go to the district, uh, you know uh, the, D the office of the Directorate of Public Health and ask them for antenatal record information, you are not going to get it. But if you actually follow the women prospectively, everybody carries the health book. So if you were to do it prospectively, actually all that information is, is there in the book. It just doesn't you know, see the light uh, of being transmitted uh, you know, in decent times to in its complete and, and, and in its entire completeness to the you know, record that is actually available in the, uh, uh, the Tamil Nadu Health Systems database. But nevertheless, the antenatal records were successfully collected uh, from 1,066 women. Um, and we also ended up collecting ultrasound data, uh, which is a very, very important uh, you know, parameter required for classifying uh, you know, preterm versus term births because we need an accurate estimation of gestational age. Um, and it so, so happens that in Tamil Nadu, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, nearly 98% of the women undergo a facility-based ultrasound. Of course, it required a lot of standardization in terms of actually reading uh, the, um, uh, the fetal ultrasounds in terms of fetal anthropometry, uh, but we ended up, um, you know, accessing sonogram data. And uh, for 1242, which were actually the live births out of the 1285, we, we were able to literally access um, the birth weight for every single live birth that was, um, that was because it's literally 100% institutional births, and every institution records birth weight. So what we ended up doing was to provide electronic scales to all the facilities that our, uh, our mothers, um, in the catchment area of where our mothers delivered, and ended up training uh, the, uh, the, um, you know, uh, the OBGYN staff nurses were actually taking the birth weight.
And uh, as a secondary check, we ended up calibrating uh, the um, uh, the birth weight measured by uh, the um, the actual fertility birth attendants. It was not possible for us to measure every birth weight within 24 hours of the birth that happened. For those births that happened and they were able to act, actually reach the healthcare facility within 24 hours, we cross verified in terms of the you know the birth weight measurement per se. We recognize there are some uncertainties in the routine birth weight reporting, but. Uh, we ended up doing 10% of the um, of all our mothers being reweighed by one of our. Uh, but we we essentially wanted to rely on facility recorded birth weight, uh, but abstracted prospectively, and so there are an and to and measured on a scale with a reasonable level of accuracy. Because if you're going to scale up these studies, you're not going to be able to collect birth weight information from every possible birth. Uh, and, uh, you know, that happens, you know, uh, everywhere else across uh, Tamil Nadu. And we ended up, um, you know, assessing exposures uh, amongst um, uh, um, 1121 of the 1242 live births that happened uh, by m uh, measuring uh, in the household um, uh, microenvironment, in the kitchen, living and near outdoor areas of the household um, um, uh, across all trimesters. Um, so most, um, you know, women got a single 24-hour measurement um, across every trimester. Uh, you know, um, a small proportion of uh, women, about 31 uh, women, uh, could not complete measurements across all trimesters. But we made sure that they were measured at least once every season. In Tamil Nadu, we don't have too many seasons. It's just hot and really hot. Uh, so, uh, you know, there wasn't, you know, too much of a difference between, uh, you know, temperature uh, induced differences in ablation exposures. So as long as we covered two seasons, you know, we still ended up getting a reasonable estimate of pregnancy period exposures. Um, and we, uh, to validate this, you know, back um, when we were doing the study, the kind of gadgets that uh, one can carry actually um, on the person to measure air pollution exposures are quite heavy. They are about 2.5 kg, so it's not very easy for a pregnant woman uh, to carry these gadgets, especially in the second and the third trimester of the pregnancy. Uh, and uh, there are also safety issues in terms of carrying the gadgets. The gadgets vibrate. Uh, they, uh, you know, use a battery pack. Uh, often have to be recharged using a power bank. So, you know, these there are several issues in some terms of actually doing personal exposure measurements. Uh, so, we ended up um, collecting time activity recalls uh, from these pregnant women throughout the pregnancy. Uh, in fact, every month to sort of really look at, you know, if their behavior changed as the pregnancy progressed. Did they spend more time outdoors versus indoors or indoors versus outdoors to sort of really look at, you know, any transitions to uh, um, the microenvironmental, uh, um, you know, th uh, and it, it so turned out not a very healthy um, uh, trend. Most women reported spending anywhere between 14 to 18 hours indoors, uh, especially if it was a, you know, a, a primary birth. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it may be a characteristic of um, uh, the socioeconomic status um, uh, of the women who sought care in primary health care. Uh, healthcare centers as well as, you know, because essentially not, you know, um, highly educated, uh, you know, and very few, um, uh, uh, you know, people beyond the college level of education. So most people were not working. So since they were not working and, you know, about 60% of the births are, uh, you know, most in, in Tamil Nadu, it's usually a single child or two children amongst the period of, you know, so this is Chennai metropolitan area and, and a district adjoining. So this is all, you know, peculiarities that make it, you know, somewhat uh, non-generalizable in a way. But nevertheless, they are uh, the exposure measurement. We are quite confident, uh, uh, you know, represent uh, the the actual exposures for the women because we actually had measurements in uh, the kitchen, the living, and the near outdoors, and the time spent in each one of these microenvironments to be able to reconstruct the exposures. Um, and um, and this is the distribution um, essentially of uh, the um, uh, the birth weight um, as well as the uh, PM two point five um, exposures uh, across um, uh, the uh, the rural and the urban arms. And as you can. Uh, um, see, uh, you know, the uh, the mean um, exposures for rural women 
were higher, uh, about 104.76 micrograms per meter cube of PM2.5. When compared to the urban, uh, which was about 70 micrograms, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was a skewed distribution, and clearly the rural, uh, you know, um, um, uh, exposures are explained by about uh, in Tamil Nadu at the time when we conducted the study, about 35 percent or rather 40 percent of um, the women enrolled uh, were using uh, biomass as their primary cook fuel. Um, so there is a continuum, as you can see, between all the way between, uh, you know, under 10 micrograms um, um, in some of the cleanest parts of um, rural Tamil Nadu. Uh, so an, uh, an LPG using rural Tamil Nadu household in a village that is primarily transitioned all to LPG is some of the cleanest uh, you know, exposure setting that you can encounter, uh, and uh, you know, even urban Chennai is not uh, is not as 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 bad um, as a biomass using household. Uh, you know, in Delhi, of course, it can uh, can mimic a biomass using household even in the ambient environment. So all the way between you know uh, um, around 10 micrograms to about 350 micrograms was our range uh, of exposures, um, and as you can see, our low birth weight prevalence was about 15. Uh, percent in uh, our cohort. Uh, so we ended up uh, building multivariate models to sort of really look at the relationship between pregnancy period PM 2.5 exposures and birth weight as continuous metrics uh, while adjusting for uh, gestational age, infant sex, maternal BMI, maternal age, history of a previous low birth weight child, birth order, and season of um, conception. Um, and um, we estimate that, uh, you know, pregnancy period PM, uh, a 10 microgram increase in pregnancy period PM 2.5 exposures is associated with a 4 gram decrease, uh, you know, in birth weight and a 2% increase in prevalence of low birth weight. Um, and uh, while this may not seem very uh, impressive, you know, what is a 4 gram change in birth weight per 10 microgram per meter cube? You can imagine, uh, you know, if Delhi is at 120 on the average or maybe even, you know, um, 200 or maybe even uh, around 200 for the most parts, and if the, gu the WHO guideline value is about 10 micrograms, you can sort of really expect at least a 100 gram difference or more uh, for people living in, you know, the most polluted areas compared to the least polluted areas. And for, uh, you know, depending on, um, you know, how the other risk factors play out. Uh, and if the low birth weight prevalence, even in, um, even in, uh, I think, uh, from what I recall, even in Delhi, the low birth weight prevalence is about 14%. So it's not unlike, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, probably in Haryana or some of the, um, uh, or in Bihar, uh, you know, which have some of the highest prevalence of low birth weight is upwards of 30%. But even in a state like Delhi, it's not exactly, you know, 3% or 2% uh, like what you might expect in the state of New York or, uh, you know, California for that matter, uh, because of the large, you know, um, uh, you know, influx of, um, uh, I mean, the large, uh, what do you call, uh, distribution of um, um, uh, the large, uh, or rather a large proportion of the people being, um, uh, being um, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, of a lower socioeconomic class. Uh, so, um, and the other important thing uh, was that we ended up doing stratified analysis for term versus preterm births and um, um, estimated. So if you have a higher risk of preterm births, for example, so for example, uh, so a 28.2 uh, gram decrease for preterm births. Uh, so the pre, you know, uh, the preterm births were impacted significantly more than term births, which would be um, which would be consistent with uh, with the biological plausibilities because you know already uh, you are at an increased uh, vulnerability for uh, for uh, for this particular endpoint and air pollution ends up uh, you know exacerbating it. Um, um, so um, we think that uh, the study provides some of the first quantitative exposure response functions centered on more proximal measures of exposure for birth weight, um, essentially household measures, 
Uh, if you look at you know what uh, developed country studies have used in these types of studies, often they are central site monitors. Uh, the central site monitors in India, for example, for PM 2.5 are far too thinly spread uh, to be able to sort of really assign, you know, if, uh, for example, even in Delhi, which has some of the highest uh, density of PM 2.5 monitors, you know, and um, to sort of really look at how much exposure misclassification that might be happening, how representative is the, you know, the monitor recorded values uh, for your 24-hour exposure without sort of really knowing how much, you know, time you spend indoor versus outdoor, you know, and where outdoor uh, to sort of, you know, we just don't have enough information to sort of really look at what might be the degree of uh, exposure misclassification based on using an ambient measure. And thus far, household measures uh, in relation to pregnant women have not um, uh, have, have not been very possible. Um, so we think that um, uh, this is a, a you know fairly um, a robust um, a way of uh, reconstructing exposures uh, for pregnant women, and it uh, certainly uh, uh, provides um, uh, provides evidence from using methods and protocols. A lot of times, uh, direct readout instruments and other kinds of techniques often used in PM 2.5 measurements have been fraught with a lot of measurement uncertainty. So we ended up using gadgets that rely on mass-based gravimetric methods that are considered, uh, you know, the gold standard for uh, such measures. Um, and so uh, we think that um, using well-validated study instruments and protocols while developing, and we didn't want to sort of really um, look at uh, measuring, you know, more than what is necessary. So we're measuring uh, once every trimester to sort of really look at trimester specific differences seemed um, to uh, pick up the association. So if you look at um, uh, really policy level implications and where we are moving in that direction, uh, the biggest, you know, uh, the, the mileage we got um, out of this entire exposure response is, you know, what might be a change um, associated with biomass use when compared to LPG using the exposure response relationships that we have estimated. And uh, in the TAFE cohort, we estimate uh, about a 72 gram change uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, where Tamil Nadu exposures, even in a household air pollution uh, related setting, say for example, when biomass is used in Tamil Nadu, the concentrations expected in Tamil Nadu are far less than what might be expected in Haryana or in uh, Punjab or, you know, any of the other households, uh, mainly because of the duration of the cooking and the family size, um, uh, you know, um, and the cooking um, and the types of foods that are uh, that are cooked. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, you know, uh, the maximum duration that a rural family cooks is about half an hour. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the temperature, uh, you know, most of the time is so hot uh, that, you know, it's and usually the type of food that is cooked is also does not require constant pres uh, presence near the stove. So the woman often, you know, puts this, uh, you know, the pot on the stove and tends to it a, a little bit. If she has a young child, you know, she might spend a lot of time uh, near the stove, but, you know, doesn't, it's not the, you know, 40 to 50 uh, rotis that uh, require uh, the woman to be uh, sitting next to the stove uh, most of the time. So the exposures are far greater. So if you were to explain and, and if you're looking at a woman are poorer, have you know far uh, you know um, uh, less uh, um, you know status in terms of maternal health, so you can expect that this could easily be two to three times as much of an impact for rural women in uh, you know in the poorer states where the air, household air pollution exposures are greater and the maternal health status is poorer, um, um, so to say. And um, you know, um, and um, so we think that. Uh, you know, we might actually, the, the study might be in the path of making an integrated, we talked about the integrated exposure response for stroke, mortality, but how about, you know, starting from a health endpoint that is amenable to exposure response in India in the near term. Uh, so outdoor air pollution studies developed, done in developed countries find a 16 gram uh, decline. Uh, pregnant women living with a smoker have about 30 to 40 grams smaller babies. Pregnant women who smoke themselves have babies that are about 200 grams lighter. Uh, you know, household air pollutions from low-income countries find an 86-gram decline, and the TAFE study in Tamil Nadu estimates a 72-gram decline. 
So you can see, you know, pretty much, you know, how uh, the, uh, the um, you know, you can uh, look at uh, uh, the, uh, the um, from the outdoor air pollution to uh, uh, smoking, there seems to be the shape of the exposure response curve may not quite be the shape that I showed you. It seems to be linearly, uh, you know, increasing. We don't know where it might actually plateau out uh, uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, it seems like, uh, to be consistent, there's a consistent pattern that the uh, the outdoor air pollution is associated with, uh, you know, the same uh, endpoint that the uh, that, that, that the smoking is, um, and uh, focusing on low birth weight and pregnant women also allows us to focus on a whole range of other adverse uh, birth outcomes that uh, previous household air pollution studies have been uh, have been able to focus on, including stillbirth, preterm birth, you know, IUGR, neural tube defects, miscarriages, and uh, so forth. Um, and uh, there is a whole range of, you know, uh, ambient air pollution and congenital abnormalities that have been examined also, uh, and as have been done in the smoking uh, literature. Uh, but, you know, uh, what I want to sort of conclude with is that um, um, given uh, the commonality of pathways that we think are currently operating, uh, in terms of exposures and health outcomes across combustion sources. Uh, if a stroke, uh, you know, mortality uh, in a stroke, ischemic heart disease, uh, uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, lung cancer, there seems to be consistency of evidence across the ambient air pollution literature between developed and developing countries, the household air pollution literature, the secondhand smoke literature, and the smoking literature. The, a similar picture is emerging for adverse pregnancy outcomes. And adverse pregnancy outcomes are likely, you know, currently they are not included in the burden of disease estimates, but we think that, um, you know, focusing on adverse pregnancy outcomes is important, and they are likely to account for a major proportion of the attributable disease uh, burden in India, mainly because the baseline prevalence of this particular outcome is um, is quite high. India still has some of the highest rates of low birth weight uh, prevalence. Uh, the ubiquity of air pollution exposures and the high prevalence of adverse pregnancy outcomes uh, argue uh, definitely for a concerted effort. Uh, but you know, uh, but if you can sort of really think of augmenting the surveillance registries for birth outcomes, unlike the cost of death, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, records that are um, quite challenging in terms of sort of really training up a lot of people and sort of really accurately, uh, you know, reporting the cost of death. Birth weight is a relatively simple, um, you know, um, uh, measure to, uh, to sort of implement consistently. Uh, and birth outcomes, whether it is miscarriages, stillbirth, they're all being uh, recorded with a fair amount of um, 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 a fair amount of diligence and can be certainly um, um, argumented. And uh, this can provide fertile grounds. Um, and um, I think, um, uh, you know, because these are relatively shorter term outcomes, if you were to, for example, follow it in the context of a natural experiment, the LPG program rolls out in some states. Some states go from, you know, 80% biomass to, say, maybe 30% biomass within, which is what happened in Tamil Nadu 10 years ago. It was 70% biomass. And now it's close to, you know, less than 10% biomass. In some districts, uh, you know, it continues to be, uh, we are actually right now conducting a randomized control trial, uh, you know, uh, providing LPG uh, to biomass using populations. And we had to search high and low uh, for a district in Tamil Nadu where we would find enough biomass using, uh, you know, households. And except for a few districts in Tamil Nadu, it's less than 10 percent. So, you know, and if you're looking at uh, going uh, about this prospectively uh, in states that are rapidly facing out this particular source of exposure, here is a low hanging fruit, you know, a year of follow up and some multicentric studies can really provide the answer for the evidence. And it's not just low birth weight, you know, there is, you know, child ARI and a whole range of other benefits. And most importantly, uh, you know, um, um, chronic obstructive lung disease, ischemic heart disease, you know, old people are already dying from a lot of different conditions. 
it's not charismatic enough uh, for a policy maker to step up the pedal for acting on it right but if you're looking at young children uh, you know and pregnancy outcomes uh, and we have a huge history of conditional cash transfers uh, being successful in boosting up institutional deliveries anc behavior uh, so it might be uh, you know uh, very amenable to behavioral interventions and we think that uh, app you know adverse pregnancy impacts especially as it relates to child cognition you know other kinds of you know lifetime uh, impacts may uh, may allow us to sort of really add momentum to equality actions and finally uh, interdisciplinary engagement is definitely um, really critical uh, even in this particular uh, study uh, we had a tough time working with obstetricians um, uh, you know sonologists uh you know um uh, pediatricians uh, for our um, child outcomes as well as our own team of exposure um scientists to sort of really um, make this project happen and i think such types of engagement are really critically needed to pull these types of studies off so uh, grateful thanks from our team in chennai for your patient listening